team is back with another episode of Topical Explainers for the seventh chapter of CAIE AS level Pure One Mathematics. In this video, we will be discussing all about differentiation. And to simplify the topic and provide us with all the information we need, we have Pratyush here with us. Hello, guys. This is differentiation, uh, one of my favorite topics in Pure. Um, today, we're going to be looking at what a derivative is. Very basic. You don't need to know any prior calculus knowledge for this. And then we're going to look at some more stuff about derivatives like chain rules, how to make a tangent on a line, stationary points. And finally, we're going to cover rates of change. OK, so as we get into this topic, you need to be confident with algebra, especially indices or exponents. There's a little, little number on top, like 2 to the power 3, that's whatever. The 3 is the exponent indice. Because this is what pops up all over this chapter. And preferably, you should have completed quadratics, functions, and coordinate geometry, because those topics are usually in co conjunction with uh, differentiation when it comes to questions in the past papers. And hopefully, if you've completed the rest of the other chapters too, that helps as well. But you don't have to. It just helps a bit if you go in order. OK. So you likely have come across the idea of gradients. I'm, I, I genuinely hope you do. Is a gradient is just a slope of a line. So I have a line, and you know slope is just rise over run. This like this line is less slope than this line. That's pretty simple to grasp. It's just like walking up a hill. What's the slope of the hill? And when talking about a line, it only has one grad, one slope, but a curve will have different slopes. Like if you take the slope at this point, it's different to, let's say, the slope at this point. So the understand that at a slope, the gradients will vary depending on the different points. And as I just did, you can draw a tangent to the curve and find its slope that way. And remember, tangent is where it just does not it just t touches it, the, touches the curve, but does not cross it. So it only cross touches the curve at that point. That's a tangent. This is not a tangent because it crosses right over it. It has to just touch it and not cross it. Um, so that's how you, that's a really crude method of finding a gradient graphically. You can draw the curve out. You can draw a little tangent to the curve. And then you can find the rise difference in x over run difference. But the difference in y is rise over run. Rise over run, you get gradient. But this method is really inaccurate. Why? Because your drawings will be inaccurate. And when your drawings are inaccurate, your tangent could be inaccurate. Your points taken could be not accurate. So you know you lose a lot of the accuracy. So to get exact slopes. You, we use calculus, and this is a mathematics of continuous change. Sounds scary, but it just it isn't that scary. Trust me. Let's be, so that's the idea. Let's get started. And usually in calculus, you are always using limits, but this course barely requires just the idea of what a limit is and not much more. So I'll just give you guys a basic concept. How are we finding the slope of a curve? Well, take an example, f of x is x squared. So it's a little quadratic smiley face. You can see one here. We've just taken this side here. And now imagine point A as x, x squared, as you can see here, point A. And now if we add h to x and then create h being some arbitrary number for now, and we create a new point, its coordinates will be that, b. Simple enough. And now that isn't exactly a tangent to that curve at a right now, is it? But what we can do is we can reduce the value of h. We can maybe make that point here, or maybe here. And successively, we can make it closer and closer. Another way to visualize this is go to Desmos, graphing calculator, and zoom in really far onto a curve. If you zoom in far enough, it'll look like a straight line. That's a good way to look at it. So what we're doing here is basically we're zooming in. We're making that distance as small as possible until eventually 
that distance will be so small. It's virtually right next to A. It's virtually on A, if you can say even. So what's going on is we're H is approaching zero. That's what we call a limit. That arrow means it doesn't ever exactly get to zero. It doesn't exactly all get to A, but it gets pretty close to A. So what happens when it gets close to A? Oh, there it is, limit. So what happens when it gets close to A? Well, it the line, if you join that, um, if you join the B point to A point, when they're really, really close together, the line they form, those two points, is basically a tangent to A. Uh, you don't need to know exactly how this works. You just, and here's the formula, the first principles formula. Fancy for This is a usually given to calculus students, the first thing they do. It's, it looks complicated. It's big and complicated. That thing looks scary. But it it's really simple. The rules, once you start working with this, you understand how simple the rules boil down to. So I'm not going to tell you guys how to use this formula. Just know that it exists. You don't have to memorize it or anything. And understand that as you approach zero, that's a limit. As you get closer and closer to A, the difference between the two points will just be a line that makes a tangent. Okay, you don't need to this know is, that. By the way, this is also essentially uh -huh. just rise over a run, right? Like yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. Itself. Good point. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I forgot to mention that. So here, this, as Vyoma said, this is just the difference in y, and this is a difference in x, because one point was x, one point was x plus h. So the difference between those two is, yeah. So this are y, y. The difference in y is the difference in x. And this will give us a slope because that's what a differentiation. That's what a derivative is. It's a slope. Uh, at this level, you just need to think of it as a slope. Rise over run. So here's the fundamentals What of notation you need to know dy by dx, that means the derivative of x. Um, that derivative is a function, it's like an expression. It's a, it's an expression. And differentiate is an operation like addition or multiplication. Different To differentiate means similar wording to add or subtract. And there's always the respect to, which means uh, which, for a change in x, what is the change in y? And the d you can think of as a small change in. Like you know, delta u is sometimes in physics. It means a big change in. So what this basically means is small change in y over small change in x. So small rise over small run, what does that give you the slope at the point? And here's the actual differentiation formulas you need to know for this uh, specification AS level. Um, you may have come across this in IGCSE or prior levels a bit as well. And it, this looks a bit complicated, so let's find the rule. What's going on here? If y is x to the power n, then dy dx is n x to the power min n minus 1. So what all we've done is first, well, that's not that's a terrible one. First, we've multiplied by the power, and then we've subtracted the power minus 1. So multiply by the power and reduce the power by one. Multiply the term by the power, reduce the power by one. That's all it is. And A represents a constant. If there's a constant, then you can just keep it there. Constant multiplying the x, keep that in mind. Then you can multiply the A, A n. It doesn't really matter. You can even Keep it outside as we when later we come to integration and stuff. But right now it doesn't really matter. If there's an a, you just a multiplying the x. You can just multiply the a and n, and same reduce the power. Right. So this is a pretty common formula. You're going to be using this a lot. So let's just get some practice. If y is x to the power five, then we're going to multiply by the power. So five. We're going to multiply by five, and you're going to reduce the power by one. So the power four. That's it. That's that's dy dx for you. Awesome. Let's do another one. Okay. First, I want to multiply by three. There's a constant term, and I want to reduce the power by one. So three times two over three will give me just two x. We'll reduce the power to the power two. That's our derivative. 
Okay. What's going on here? We have a fractional power. Same, still same thing. Nothing changes. You multiply by 3 over 2. So 8 times 3 over 2. 4 times 12. And then x to the power. We reduce this by 1. What's 3 over 2 minus 1? It's 1 over 2. Do you see where it came from? I hope so. We're going to get more practice on this later. These are some quick examples. Oh, here's a good, nice little one. Find d dx1. What is 1? Well, you can write 1 as x to the power 0. And that means when we multiply it by 0 times x to the power minus 1, reduce the power. Well, 0 times anything is just 0, so it's just 0. So that means a derivative of a constant term without x in it is 0. OK. That's the simple stuff. Now let's just look at a few more complicated indice rules. So this is where you're comfortable. You should be comfortable with indices. What does two over x to the power four mean? Well, you can write this as two to the power x minus four. The minus means it's the bottom of the fraction. Uh, which one of these rules is that? I don't know. One of those. Oh, here it is. This one. And if f of x is 2x minus 4, same rule, multiply by the power, so minus 8, 2 times minus 4, and then we subtract 4 minus 1, so that's minus 5. That is f of x in this case. Here, what's going on here? We have a root 2 over the 2 and the x. So I can write this as root 2 times root x. And what does root x mean? That means x to the power half. I hope you know that one as well, this rule here. And if I have root 2 x to the power half, I multiply by a half root 2 over 2, multiplied by a half, and I reduce half by 1, so minus half. And questions typically, examiners, Cambridge examiners, they like you to put the answer with no negative indices. So here I would write it as minus x minus 8 over x to the power 5. I'd write this as root 2 by 2 root x, because the minus makes it on the bottom of the fraction. That's my derivative. That's my derivative. What's going on here? Well, I have a funny little fraction, and I have an x. So I'm going to make this. The funny part makes it x to the power 4 and then divided by 3 because of the root 3. And then this is times x. x times 4. So this is x power 1. You add them for 7 over 3. That's my function. And now I'm going to differentiate this. It gives me 7 by 3 x. So, uh, 4 by 3. That's my function. I can write it in whatever form I choose. It's equivalent. It's okay. No negative powers. Okay, next thing. When we have multiple terms in our expression and we're differentiating it, then you can differentiate each term separately. Multiple terms as in their separate terms being added, not products or quotients. Um, here's an example. First of all, I see we have plus 5, plus 8. This is same as saying, OK, first let's deal with this fraction here, actually. Uh, I'm going to write, since this is a denominator, I can write this separately, 6x6 six, six over x squared plus 8 over x squared, which just simplifies down to y is 6x to the power 4 plus 8x to the power minus 2 minus 5 x to the power 3 plus 3. You can write this as d dx here, d dx here, d dx here. You could do it all separately, or you can differentiate d dx, the whole thing. It's the same as differentiating each one separately, because they're adding or subtracting. That's what's going on here. So I'm going to do the first one, 24 x 3. 8 times minus 2 minus 16, x power, subtract 1, 3, minus 5 times 3, 15, times, lessen the power. And then that's a constant term, so 0. That is my different, that is dy dx. 
Okay. So those are the two rules you need to know. Here's an even cooler rule. Chain rule. So if you take something like y equals this x squared plus 1 to the power 20, or that, this one you could open in binomial expansion, right? It would take forever, but you could do it, theoretically. And then you could do it that way. But this one, you we are binomial... Whoa, what's going on with my pen? This one, our binomial expansion won't work because we haven't learned how to do that. And even so, it wouldn't be completely accurate. So there's a different method to do this. It's called the chain rule. And the way we do it, we consider part of the func function, part of the equation as a separate function and make it two separate functions composite. So let's look at the example here. We're going to take this part here and make it equal to u. And so hence y is equal to u to the power 20, which is the same as our original. It just we have a u in there. And that what the chain rule tells us is that dy dx, same as rate of change of u, du times du by dx. The way this works is you can just think of it as a fraction. The, when you're multiplying, the top and bottom cancel. So you just get dy dx. That's essentially how it works. So what that means for us here is if y is u to the power 20, then dy with respect to u, because that's a variable we're differentiating, is 20 u to the power 20 minus 1, 19. And that's the first part of ours. So we also need du dx, where u is x squared plus 1, then what's the differentiation of that? 2x plus 0. You can ignore the plus 0 because 1 is a constant term. OK, so what do we, how do we get the answer? Well, we multiply dy du times du dx. So 2x times 20u to the power 19 gives us 40xu to the power 19. And don't leave u in there, because that's not a thing that was, we made up u. So we have to replace it by its original thing. So that means u was x this. So we're going to put that back. x squared plus 1 to the power 19. OK, that's how we differentiate a more complicated function. Break by it the down way, I would into yeah, yeah. I would also just like to point out something. Like, as you can see here, we use the chain rule, right? But sometimes yeah. it can be long. Uh, I've actually realized this and, and also seen this in a book once. What yeah. they did was they just did it directly. Like, they just basically did the differentiation and then they just mm -hmm. multiplied it by the differentiation of whatever is inside the bracket. Essentially, we're doing literally the same thing. But instead of showing, like, how dy upon du is this, du upon dx is this. Like we could do the same thing here. For example, if we were talking about y equals to x squared plus one to the power 20, right? What we mm -hmm. can do is that we could just put the 20 in the front, right? And then we could multiply that, uh, and then just put x squared plus one to the part to the power 19, and then multiply it by whatever's inside the bracket and differentiate that. So that's gonna be two x. And that essentially yeah. gives us the same answer, but it's just like a quicker method because sometimes, especially in long questions, uh, mm -hmm. you don't usually have space to, you know, simplify it properly. You know, it's just That's like true, a cheap yeah. method. Once you understand the concept, you can like skip a few steps, but make sure you understand what you're doing. Awesome. Okay, there's one more question on the chain rule. Uh, how do you uh, just get some practice doing the same thing on the other? function f of x. Let's use Vyomish's method here. Uh, I'm going to write it as 3x plus 5 to the power half, because I know that's a square root. And first, I'm going to do the square root thing. I'm going to multiply it by half. Then I'm going to plus 5. That's my u, by the way, if you, for if you still want to do that method. Uh, and I'm going to reduce the power by 1. 
so minus a half. And I'm going to multiply by the derivative of the stuff inside the inside the brackets, the u. So 3x plus 5. 5 makes 0. 3x makes 3. So times 3. So our answer will be 3 by 2. 3x plus 5 minus half, which is on the bottom fraction of a root if you want to use your indice rules. So that's how you do the chain rule. Uh, make sure to get some practice on that. It's very useful later on as well. Um, and now we're going to look at gradient of a tangent and how do you could make a line with that. So you already know the derivative will give you the gradient. You know, little change in x, little change in y over little change in x, gradient, slope, da -da. Uh, And that'll give you the gradient of a tangent to the point. Let's say, I think I have a diagram on here. No, I don't. Let's say I have a curve and I want to find the gradient at x equals minus 2. Then it'll give me the slope of a line, which it will be tangent to minus 2. Slope. Um, so if you know the gradient, which is the derivative, and you know the point it passes through, which is just the x value and the y value coordinates, you can make an equation using our chapter 3 knowledge of coordinated geometry. Uh, here's a little extension thing. Sometimes questions will ask you to find a perpendicular or a normal to a, a perpendicular or normal to the curve, which is just perpendicular to the tangent at that point, you know, 90 degrees. But let's not do, get into that right now. It's a bit confusing. Let's just do this question. Here's a curve given. Y is x, da-da-da-da, when x is 2. Find the y-coordinate. Y is minus 2, minus 3 to the power of 5, 25. So our point is minus 2, 25. And what's the gradient of y? Well, when it says gradient, you should automatically be thinking derivative, differentiate, the that one, yes. So we, we don't, you could technically open the brackets or we could just use the chain rule we just learned. And that will be dy by dx will be what's, you multiply by 2, 2, x minus 3. And then we multiply by the, the derivative of the stuff in the brackets, which is just 1, because x. So our derivative dy dx is just 2x minus 6. And at x equals minus 2, that means minus 4, minus 6, minus 10. So our slope dy dx at x minus 2 is minus 10. Okay, so hence give the equation of the tangent to the curve when x is 2. Right, this should be pretty straightforward. Now we know the slope, m, minus 10. We know the point, point. So you can just use whatever line formula you want to use. I'm going to use y equals mx plus c. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to use 25, which is my y equals minus 10 is my gradient at point x is 2 plus c. So c comes out to be 5, I think. Is that right? Oh, yeah. 20. 5c. So c is 5. So our line will be y equals minus 10x plus 5. This line passes through the point at the curve when x is 2, passes through this point, and has exact gradient to be a tangent to that curve at that point. Awesome. Oh, here's the little graph then. Uh, how do I erase? So this is our curve. And you can see that at point 25, as we just found, it has, this is the equation of our, the blue is our line, this line that we have our equation for. Okay, that's a tangent. I hope you can find tangents now to a curve. Hey, by the way, can you go back to the previous question? Yes. Uh, does it not say the normal to the curve? Oh, this one? 
Yeah. Oh, that's right. I should explain that, shouldn't I? Oh, I think you found the tangent. It, Wait, yeah, the yeah. question the, actually asks. The question says tangent. tangent. Yeah, that's correct, though. Yeah. I, I did skip over this a bit. Okay, so if I were to find the tangent to this point, I just find the perpendicular here. And as we know, m1 times m2, when they're perpendicular, line times perpendicular is minus 1. So it would be uh, minus 1 over minus 10. So that would be 1 tenth. So if my gradient was 1 tenth and it passed through the same point, that would be the normal to that curve at that point. Make sense? Okay. Increasing and decreasing functions. All right. So, so you can try this on your own right now, but I'm just going to skip ahead because I've done it already. Below is the curve this. Find the derivative of it and find the gradient. So just the value of dy dx for the following values of x. So when you differentiate it, it comes out to 6x minus 3x squared. And what this looks like is this. At point x equals 1, our gradient is increasing. It's a, Our gradient is a positive value. And that means the curve is increasing. It's going up. We always look at it from left to right. Yeah, left to right. If it's, if it's going up, it's a positive gradient. If it's going down, it's a negative gradient, which means, and a gradient is just a derivative. So if the derivative is positive, going up. Derivative is negative, going down. What if derivative is zero? That means it's neither going up or not, nor down. It's stationary. The slope is zero. If the derivative de derivative is zero, the slope is zero. So that what that's what it looks like at x equals two. And what about x equals 2.5? Well, it's going down. The derivative is negative. The, gr the gradient is negative, which means it's decreasing. Basically, just think of the derivative as the slope. And a positive slope is increasing. Negative slope is decreasing. Zero slope is neither. It's just chilling. That's all for increasing and decreasing. Some questions will ask you, for what range is this function decreasing? So you might need to show for what values is this derivative positive, y dx is greater than 0, for what x. Those questions do come up. So just quadratic inequality that if you need to. OK. This comes in more handy later on, because now we're looking at second derivatives. Sounds scary, but you're just differentiating and differentiating again. It's crazy, I know. So notation is this, or, oh, forgot what this is called. This is called f prime x. That's how you pronounce it. And uh, I suppose this is called f prime prime x. Do you know Vyamish? For which one? For the little double dash. Is it called f prime prime x, or is it like f double prime? Or is there, I is there think a word it's for it? double prime. Or double prime. The double f prime. Double, prime it's prime like the second derivative. derivative. Second derivative, mm -hmm. that's what we call it. Yeah, f prime prime. Double prime, right. OK, so this is our equation. We want to find the second derivative. Very simple. Differentiate it once to get the first derivative, x. I'm not, I'm not even saying the steps. You just do the der multiply, reduce the power. And then you do it again. So that means 2 times 3, 6, x minus 1 minus 4. That's our second derivative. OK. So here's a little graphical representation. If this was our first curve, this curve here, then the first derivative looks like this, this curve. And then now our second derivative just becomes a line, as we can see with this linear. OK. So that's all for second derivative. You might think, why would we ever need this? But it is useful. It will help us distinguish between max points and min points. Remember we looked at stationary points, where the curve is, uh, the derivative is 0 on the curve? Well, sometimes there's two types. Three, actually. We only need to do two. So, yeah, we'll just look at that next slide. 
it might be a maximum or a minimum. Let's see what that is. Um, a point where the gradient is zero, derivative is zero, is called stationary point, because if you draw a tangent to it, it's parallel to the x-axis. It's a straight line, no rise, no run, no rise, only run. <laughs> it's flat, okay? So the second derivative will tell us the nature of the secondary point, because there's different types, aren't there? You can have a maximum point, because that's as high. It disappeared, my slides disappeared, wait. There, they're back. Okay, that's a maximum point, because that's as high as the curve goes. Or there's a minimum point, that's as low as it goes. There's a third type of point, which we don't need to know, it's called the inflection. Um, here's a curve given. Find the coordinate of the two stationary points and give the nature of each point. How do we do this? Very simple, first differentiate it, dy dx is equal to, oh, would you look at that, third times three, x squared minus x minus two. Is that right? Yes. This And if since dy dx is equal to zero, you can say this is equal to zero. I'm gonna use my calculator here to find values of x. If it turn on here. One minus one minus two. Cheating. So, <laughs> I'm I mean, write still this fact technically allowed. For you now, at least. Yeah, if you show the little factorization step, it's technically you did some work <laughs> in Kiki here. So my x is either minus one or x is two. Those are my two stationary points. But hey, those are only the x values of the stationary points. I need the y coordinate, x and y for the coordinates. So I can plug that into. Oh, why did I make such an awkward equation? Uh, two cubed minus half times two squared. I'm basically plugging in two into my y equation here. Minus two times two. So one of the points is two minus 10 by three. That's a really weird number. And then the other point is minus one What's the, what's the y value? Minus one. One. Minus one. Seven by six. Odd. Okay, these are my two coordinates of the stationary points. Now it says to find the nature of each point. How do we do that? Use the second derivative. If this was dy dx, this here, we're going to differentiate it again. Ch change color for the second. Uh, that'll give me 2x minus 1 equals, so you don't need to equals. That is my second derivative. Let me just put f prime because I don't write th this. Um, and what this, what we're going to do here, we're going to plug in our x value to this. So when x is 2, 2 times 2 minus 1, that gives me 4 minus 1, 3. And Add this, this is a key point right here in the screen box. If your second derivative is greater than zero, it's a minimum point. If it's less than zero, it's a maximum point. They're kind of flipped. Try to remember this because this is really important. Uh, as you get, so this three is more than zero. So I know it's a minimum point. So this, this one is a min. And let's try for this one then. Minus one times two minus one minus three. Wow, uh, this is max point. Why? Because minus three is less than zero, which means it is a maximum point. And, oh, why are my graphs always popping up in the randomest places? Okay, here's our graph of this y here. You can see, clearly see the two maximum and minimum max and min points. Here's our minus one. Hold on a second. Did I do something wrong? I think that the graph might be wrong because I also cross-checked. Yeah, the, the graph looks a bit silly. I think I may have put the graph from a different thing I changed later on. Okay, just ignore the graph then. You can try this on your own in Desmos. 
can make the line you can uh, plug in this plug in the and then look at the stationary points they will be these two points okay oh right little thing here uh, points of inflection they're not on the syllabus and that's when d2 y dx squared is exactly zero and what that looks like is you know a cubic graph it goes like that it's that point right there where it changes from being curved inwards like like that to curved outwards it's when the concavity changes that's the word uh, you don't need to know this you just know sometimes some questions some poorly questions might have that but they won't have it on your syllabus so if you know now you do oh, know if, yeah. if something by the way up. i just want to mention that the graph is actually like it's kind of fine when it is negative one it's maximum when it is two it's uh you know the minimum it's just that graph it just i think it's not positioned well most likely oh. because i just graphed it right now and it's correct is like, it like is what, it the what you calculated was actually correct i think that graph is mm -hmm. wrong here oh uh just uh, my bad then silly graph okay so now that you know how to use maximum minimum points they can be really helpful in some word questions sometimes they're presented as word questions you need to make an equation then use differentiation to find the appropriate stationary point here's a little word question i stole from a textbook um Figure one shows a sheet of metal, 40 centimeter. The diagram shows that. Square x by x is cut from each corner. They're bent upwards to make a box. Find the value of x that maximizes the volume of the box. You can see how this will be useful in real life if you want to cut a box and make the biggest volume. OK, how do we do this? Well, I want an equation for the volume of the box. And. Yeah, and then I can differentiate the, the, the max. How do I get the volume of the box? Well, this is x. I know that because this, when it folds up, will be x long height. And if if this whole thing is 40, then I've cut x from here, x from here. Then this right here is 40 minus 2x. I know that. 40 minus 2x. 2x, not just x x height i know the l, l b and i don't want to know this as well and it says it's square so this is also same the whole thing is 40 40 minus 2x 40 minus 2x okay so my volume is just l b it's okay all the three sides volume is x and 40 minus 2x whole square um i could open the brackets here I think I'll do it that way. Yeah, open the brackets better here. Um, 400. Also, something. by the way, I just wanted to point out something. Uh, in yeah. this case, there the only option is to actually open the brackets. Because what you can yeah. see here is that uh, there's an X outside, right? We haven't really gotten to that point yet where we could uh, differentiate when two uh, things multiply together, if they're not a constant. So in this case, just remember, this is the variable. So mm -hmm. here, you need to expand it all out and then differentiate it. Yeah, that's a really good point, Vimish. Because if this was a constant, we could just have taken the derivative of the square bit and then multiplied. It wouldn't matter. But since it's a variable, it, there's a special case for this. It's called the product rule. You learn it later. But right here, we can't do that. So you have to open it and multiply everything. OK, 40 times minus 2 times 2 minus 160x plus 4x squared and we multiply everything by x 1600x minus 16 squared plus 4x cubed that's my volume expression for volume now i want to know what's the stationary point and the volume what's the maximum point of the volume imagine volume as a curve and i want to find the max my thing disappeared again. Okay, I want to find the. I should just hide this one second. Mac. Oh my gosh. One second. Tech difficulties. Okay. Max. 
Oh my goodness, what's happening? Okay. Oh my, one second, man. I'm trying to draw stuff and it takes me to my other slide, slide. Like my presentation sheet instead of, wait. Keep, just start this again from this chat. Wait, uh, did you hear what I said? No, no, you're muted. Oh yeah, I was muted. I'm just saying that like, let's just take like a two minute break. I'm gonna go get some chocolate milk. Sure, sure, sure. By the way, I'm back now. Can you hear me? Hi. Hello, I had to help my mom with software. I see. You can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is it worse or better than before? It's uh, 
Same, pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So it's 45, 15. Okay. So you can start whenever you want now. Okay. Right. So you can treat volume as a curve, and we're trying to find the maximum of the curve. Say it's somewhere up here. I don't know. Um, so what's going on here? This is our equation for volume we just made. We're going to find the rate of volume change. The slope of... Well, the point where the slope is zero is the maximum point. We already established that. So we're going to find expression for the slope by dv dx. It's going to be 16, 0, 0, minus 360. I think that's right. No, yeah. it'll be 320. No, 320. 320. Whoops. 320x plus 12x square. And since dv dx or the slope is equal to 0, this is equal to 0. I'm going to cross that out here. And you can solve the equation in a method of your choice, which for me will be just punching into my calculator. The values are yeah. 20 and 20 upon 3. 20 and x equals 20 by 3. And those two values look correct, but let's do a sensibility check here. Is that sensible? Do you think if we cut 20, our thing is 40 long, right? This is 40 long. If we cut 20 from here and 20 from here, we wouldn't have anything left. We couldn't make a box. So unfortunately, this isn't right. Uh, so what the actual answer is, is 20 over 3, because we only cut thirds out of here. Yeah, otherwise we could But have I a think box. that this question is also a good example to show like how to find the minima and the maxima. So we mm -hmm. could also use the second deri deri derivative to find the answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could use the second derivative, and this would probably end up being like a minimum point where the volume yeah. is zero. Exactly. And this would be the maximum point. Yeah, that's that's smart. Okay. So that's how you can use this stuff in real life too. So it's not just a funny maths thing. Okay. Next thing. This is my favorite part of the topic. Let's go. Rates of change. That's basically what differentiation is. For a little change in y, what's the little... Wait, no. For a little change in x, what's the resulting little change in y? That's what differentiation is all about. How does one variable change with respect to the other? So let's get into it. So questions involving rates of change. We'll need you to use the chain rule and combine some different expressions to come up with the expressions you need. Here's a nice example. A side of a cube is increasing at 2 centimeters per second. Now, centimeters per second. Uh, the rate, that means it, things are happening per second. Per second usually means a rate. It's like how fast is something happening. In this much time, how much stuff does it happen? So in, in one second, 0 0.2 centimeters is increasing every one second. So that's a rate. That's not just a value. Okay. And find the rate of increase of the volume when the length is of side length 4. So what it means is the volume will change at different rates depending on how big the cube is at that point, right? <coughs> right so visualize this. Cube is expanding its side lengths, and its volume is expanding as well. It's getting bigger. And the rate of the volume change is not constant. The rate of side length change is constant, but since we know the volume is different to side length. All right, okay. Getting ahead of myself here. Right. First step, write down. Wait, no. First step, write down what you want to find. I want to find the rate of increase of volume. So I'm going to write rate of volume. No, change of volume per change of time. This is my goal. This right and i want to how will i get an expression for this well i could get an ex no. i could get volume and then differentiate is, is that feasible yes because it's a cube 
What's the volume of a cube? Side length. I'm going to call it L cubed. That's volume. So D V D T. Wait, no. D V D L. So the rate of change of volume when we change the length will give me D. Oh, I'm just writing the same thing. The rate of change of volume when we change the length a little bit is uh, 3L square differentiate. And uh, we actually don't want this. We want rate of change of volume per rate of ch per change in time, but we have rate change in volume per length. That's not our goal. But we have given some other information. The side length, the length, the change in length, it's increasing. The change in length per change in time is equal to point. Zero 0.02. This is a key concept. Every, um, how much centimeter per second is going on here? Some units. And I want to find how much centim centimeter cubed is changing per second here. You don't need to know units. This is, is going to confuse you. Physics nerd here. Um, right. So what do we have here? We have this expression. And we have this expression. And now we can use the chain rule. We can use dv dl times dl dt. And that will give us dv dt. Because the l and the l cancel by chain rule. So what does that mean? dv dt is simply 0 0.2 times 3l cubed. So I can write 0 0.6l cubed. And I want to find at side length through. So at L equals 4, what is the rate of change of volume? Well, 4 cubed, 4 cubed times 0. 0.6. 38.4. Yeah, 38.4 at L equals 4. And if you wanted to put units, this would be cm cube. Uh, that's a terrible three per second because that's the volume change per second. Volume per second. Remember this. <laughs> Make sure you have the correct expressions of what's changing with respect to what. And then you can like line them up and go ahead. One key thing to know, you can have multiple things. Let's say you had and the volume changes and that changes something else. You could have the a by d t x times no you could have three by d b and then d b times d c and d c times d x and this would be like a longer chain you see that this goes to here these cancel this goes to here this cancel uh confusing but this will also leave you with d a d t so if you have multiple expressions you can line them up in a longer chain chain rule style and eliminate them. We'll do some later. Uh, here's a, another thing that I didn't actually know this. And when I found it, I was like, whoa, you can just flip it? But yes, you can just flip it. Look at this. Um, if you divide 1 over dy dx, it actually flips it. <laughs> it's crazy. dx, dy. These are just like little numbers. What? what did I write? D Y D yeah, which isn't this silly? <laughs> the Y is on the bottom, it's crazy. Okay, why does this matter? Well, sometimes you might be given stuff in an upside down, so to speak, manner. So let's look at these. Spherical balloon is blowing blowing up, being blown up, so that its volume increases at a rate of three centimeters cubed per second. So volume is increasing. I already with that information I'm gonna write something the rate of change of volume with respect to time because it's the rate the per volume per time is uh three right and find the rate of increase of the radius that's what so i want to find the change in radius per unit time 
rate usually means per time, guys. And I want to do that when the volume of the balloon is 60. So how will I get an expression for the radius out of the volume? Simple enough. Uh, for sphere, volume is 4 by 3 pi r cubed. Oh, my r and v look very similar. Sorry. Um, By the way, I actually just wanted to point out something. Like, this is, like, mm -hmm. my uh, brain thought that I'd actually go with. What I do is that on the left, I just keep what I need to find, and I add an yeah. equal sign, and then put whatever I have given in the question. Yeah. Like, dv upon dt. And then I try to find what's the third value that I need to find. Like, for example, here in this case, right? If I write dr upon dt equals to dv upon dt times, now that I think about it, I just need to find dr, uh, wait, um, dr upon dv. Wait, say that again slowly. So essentially what I do is that I keep dr upon dt, what I need to find on the left, mm -hmm. right? And then equal it to uh, what I've been given, which is dv upon dt. And then times by something that I need to find. And what uh, looking at this equation, I know it's going to be dr upon dv. So that the t's can dt's cancel out. And then on the top, wait, sorry, the dv's cancel out. And then on the top, there's only dr. And uh, on the underneath, there's dt. Now that I've been given an, uh, something that I need to find additionally, which is dr upon dv, I know that there are two values, right? r and v and i basically need to find an, an equation or a formula that has these two values and so that's why that's how i would go to the v equals to 4.3 pi r cube because in some questions it might get confusing so that's, like that's a really good point direct. it's a really good point because sometimes you might get stuck i'm like oh i have all this information what am i meant to find and if you do yeah, it this like, way you lay it out use? it's it's super simple I, you want to find this. We already have this. What can I chain rule style multiply with to end up with that? And this might confuse you a bit. This, we'll get into it. Because this is the flippy thing that's going on here. I'll show you how that works. Uh, so we have an equation here. We know that uh, we need to find an expression for rate of change of radius over volume. So we need an expression that covers both and includes both radius and volume. That's our expression that we've come up with. And now we're going to, the way I do it is I'd um, first, what's, what's the word for it? Differentiate it by respect to radius. So I'd multiply it by three. I'm differentiating volume with respect to radius. So the radius power becomes times three, four over three times three is just four pi. And that's R square. Fun thing, this is surface area. You can, you can look into that later as well. Okay, so this is my dV over dr, but I don't want dV over dr, I want dr over dV. How do I change this? Ta-da! You flip it. You can do dr over dV is equal to 1 over 4 pi r square. And now we have all the pieces to the puzzle. We have dv dt, and we have dr dv. So we can multiply them. Uh, should I make space for this somewhere? Right here. Change color. Light blue. OK. So now we're going to find dr dt, which, according to our expression here, is equal to dv dt, which we already know is 3. So I'm going to put 3 times, uh, what did I do that? 3 over 4 pi r square, because this is our dv dt, and the bottom one is our dv, right? So we multiply those two to get dr dt, and that's our expression for dr dt. OK, I hope that made sense. There's more, the first question next after this is on this, so that'll be more practice if you didn't quite catch this. 
but basically yeah just make a little expression find what you need to find and flip if you need to flip that's the important part uh so the question actually asked what's the what's this value when volume is 60 when volume is 60 i just we Ooh. need to find the radius from the volume okay Oh, right. That's, that's, that's a great point. I was trying to think, how do I put volume into this? You can't. Because <laughs> our expression doesn't have volume in here, so we need to find the radius. So 60. Uh, I'm just going to rearrange this in my head. You can rearrange it as well. Times 3 over 4 divided by pi cube root equals I got something like two point four two eight five. Can you cross check that? Okay. Cube root sixty by pi. Yeah, two point four three, let's see. So this is my radius. And at this radius, what is the DVD DR? dt at r equals 2.43 is equal to plug it into the formula i got 0 0.0405 to three significant figures nice five, yeah yeah so that is the rate of change of radius per time so we could see meters cm per second if you want to put units, you don't have to usually with these kind of questions. Okay, so that's rate of changes. It comes all over the place in physics, in uh, um, maths, in stats, like further on stats, not like uh, AS stats. Uh, basically everywhere, rates of change are very important. Okay, so that's all the topics. There's a lot of new concepts introduced here. So there are some questions to test you on these. So let us get started. Oh, you may just chime in whenever you want to do a, a question. Would you like to do this one? Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, let's just see what this question is all about. So it's water is poured into a tank at a constant rate of 500 centimeters cube per second. Immediately note that down. So uh, dV upon dt is going to be 500. And then the depth of water in the tank, t seconds after filling up the filling starts, is at centimeters. When the depth of water is in the tank is at centimeters, the volume V of the tank is given by the following formula. Hmm. Right? And what we need to find is that find the rate at which H is increasing at the instance when H is equal to 10 centimeters. It says rate at which H is increasing. So it's talking about uh, change of H with change of time. So what we need to find is dh upon dt, right? And then let's use what I, how I think about it. So dh upon dt equals to dv upon dt, what we've already been given. And uh, we just need to see now what to put there, what we need to find extra. And in this case, it's going to be dh upon dv. And surprise, surprise, now that I think about, I need to find a formula for that relates H and V, they've already given us one. Wow. And what I'm going to, you know, it's kind of funny, actually. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. I, for some reason, remember doing this exact same paper. But yeah, anyways, so what I do is that I differentiate the formula, uh, V equals to mm -hmm. 4.3, blah, blah, blah. So it's just going to turn into dv upon uh, dh equals to 4 times 25 plus h to the power 2 times 1. Because that's the derivative from outside. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's what... Yeah, Chain the derivative inside yeah. the brackets was just one. And the co to the constant, 
uh, it's just gonna get removed automatically. Yeah, it's just gonna turn into it. zero. We could just ignore it. Yeah. So uh, let's just check if we've done that correctly. Okay. And now what we do is that we uh, need to flip it because what we need to find is dh upon dv, not dv upon dh. So dh upon dv is just gonna be one upon four times twenty five plus h square. And what yep. we're going to do now is we're going to say that dh upon dt is equal to uh, 500 times the dh upon dv that we just found right now. Okay. And now that we have found that, right, what it is asking is to find the rate of which h is increasing when h equals to 10 centimeters, right? So now what we just need to do is just put that inside of the formula, uh, the dh upon dt. So when h is equal to 10, let's see, 25 plus 100, oh wait, 10, square times 4, and then 1 divided by that value, times 500, I get 5 upon 49. Yes, same. Okay, that's nice. And um, that's going to be the rate at which h is increasing when h is equals to 10. Oh, wait, actually, we should also write uh, the unit value, unit, uh, and Units? in this case, it's going to be centimeters per second. It's just better to put it in either yeah. case. It never hurts. Exactly. Okay. Let's check the marks. So that is yeah, equivalent, basically. Two, four, four. Remember, give it in three SF. Yeah, same. So we got one mark for differentiating that, one mark for showing our funny chain rule, and one mark for three S. The what's it? Units are optional, as they show with the brackets. Okay. Oh, same question, different thing. At another instant, the rate at which h is increasing is that. Find the value of v. Okay. So we already had our expression for dv, no, dh dt from before, which was 500 by that. Written by 4, 25 plus h. 5 plus h square. Okay, so h is increasing at that. Find v. Interesting question. What does that mean? Well, dh, rate at which h is increasing, dh dt is equal to 0 0.075. Awesome. So what that means is 0 0.075 is equal to, I can just put it up there, honestly. What am I doing? 0 0.075 and I can solve for h to get the height and using the height I can then plug that into this to get the volume that is my plan and now let's just execute that plan um, I could flip these uh, flip as in like exchange 0 0.075 is equal to 425 plus h square. You get better to the 4 as well. Times 4. Um, 25 square. 625 plus 50h plus h square is equal to that, 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 uh, five thousand. By three. I think you could have and... just taken a square root on both sides. Oh, that, 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 what am I doing? We have a completed <laughs> I think square form. much more easier. Yeah, it is. Silliness. Okay. So square root 5,000 by three is equal to 25 plus h. So h is equal to. 
I mean, it could be plus minus. You never know, but there'll usually only be one answer. Let's just see why. 25. Minus 25, by the way. Plus 40 point. No, I'll get rid of the square root. It comes out to 40.82 around. And as you can see, we can only have positive 40.82 because if it is negative, then the height would be totally negative and you can't have negative height in a tank. That would be weird. So our answer comes out to uh, h is 15.8. But wait, we're not done yet. That's just the height. Now we plug the height into our formula for volume, which is 4 over 3. So I'm just going to do that. By the way, I just want to point out something. Like yeah. right now, what we're mentioning, whenever we're mentioning the values, we're actually not rounding it up. Never round up in the middle of the question. And what we're doing is just like going back to our calculator with the long value and just entering it in the second part of the question. Definitely. When you're doing these sort of like multi-step problems, if you start rounding, you're going to lose a lot of accuracy very fast. So don't round, guys. When you're showing your stuff like here, I wrote it just to this, but I actually use the same value that is on my calculator and put it into the function here. So that gives me a volume of... Okay. <laughs> it's like 6, 9, 8, 8, 8. eight. Uh, I'm just going to round it to... That's how I think I, they want us to round to. It rounds to seven, zero, nine, zero. Oh Wait, can gosh. you go back to the Wait. formula? Let me also check uh -huh. mine. Value. Seventy thousand. Wait, 000. what was the value of H again? H. Fifteen point eight two. Fifteen point eight two, right? Okay. Uh, yes. this is the value. We and plus twenty five. Cube that times four one three minus six two five zero zero upon three. I got six nine eight 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 point five. If yeah, we round same. that up to three significant figures, 70, it's gonna 000. be six nine nine zero zero. Oh right, what am I doing? Six nine nine da da da. Yeah. Not just, what we got was just eight, six zero. nine eight eight eight. Mm -hmm. But then when we round it off to sig three signal fingers, we get six nine nine zero zero. Yeah. As you can see there. Uh, one step for solving for H, one step for putting in the volume equation. Wait, wait, wait. Two two points for solving for H, one for getting the volume. Okay. Here, Vyam, you can do this one. Sure. So it says that the question, uh, the equation of a curve is such that dy upon dx is equal to 3 to the power xl half minus 3x to the power negative half. The curve passes through the point 3, comma 5. Find the x-coordinate of the stationary point. Um, I'll just equate that to 0, the derivative. And when I do that, it's going to be 3x to the power half minus 3x negative half equals to 0. And I think that the easiest way to tackle this would be to multiply both sides by x to the power or half. And what that's going to do is this, it's going to remove the negative half. And on the left, it's going to be 3x to the power or 1. And then it's going to be uh, minus 3x. That's going to be uh, x to the power 0. So that we could just uh, remove that in equal to zero. So we get three X equals to three, which basically shows that X equals to one in this situation. And so that's the first question, question number B. We have already found the X coordinate of the stationary point. What the next question asks is that set the state set of values of X for which Y increases as X increases. Hmm. Okay, that's a good question, I would say. Set of values of x for which y is increasing as x increases. What I would do now is I think I would create the second derivative. Actually, no, wait. I just realized there's only one uh, stationary point. 
right? So oh, yeah, what we're yeah, gonna yeah. do it's uh in my eyes, I think it might be a parabola. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I feel like that's what it is. Oh no 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 no. This is a derivative. So we can't exactly say much about the thing. Curve itself, yeah. Yeah, the curve itself. So, um, I guess I would just find the second derivative and see if it is the a minima or the maxima. And then from then on, maybe I could see how it would work. So it's just um, to find the second derivative, it's going to be 3 upon 2, x negative half minus, oh, you know, plus 3 upon 2. Uh, x to the power negative one. What? Negative oh, wait, negative three point two. Yeah, negative three point two. Yeah. And uh, I'm just gonna put one inside of there, and see what my value comes out to be. Oh, it's just gonna be three. Right. One to the power anything is gonna be one. Oh, so yeah. It's just gonna be three. That shows me that so, it's a minima because it's a positive, uh, it's more than zero. But then can we straight away say that um, y increases? So if I imagine a minima, it goes like this. For which y increases, as x increases. I think it will be beyond the point of the stationary point. So I believe that it will be for the values x is more than one. Would ah. that work? Like, if I think about it, like, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. a minimum point, right? We could chuck and in a test value, yeah. We could also check in a text value, but I think it would make sense. Because, oh, yeah. um, like, if we think about a minimum, right, is, this is yeah. what we got. And so, yeah. af if we think about a, a minimum, after, on the right, to the uh, stationary point, when x increases, the value of y also increases. So that kind of shows us that it's uh, x more than 1. Hmm. Because in B, we found that the x coordinate of the stationary point was 1. Yeah. So for, how do you say, how do you write this? Um, x is greater than 1. For C, what for, for when x is greater than one, then y is an increasing function. Y increases as y x increases because the derivative is always negative. Shouldn't we? Other no, just that when we did the second derivative, right? We got yeah, yeah. a positive value when we put it in the stationary point, and that means oh, so that it's a minimum. minimum point. Yeah, and if we say that it's a minimum point, minimum point, uh, what I imagine it is that it's going to be like a U-shaped uh, oh, yeah. curve, right? And then I could just immediately see, what's the question stating? Set, state the set of values of x for which y is increasing as x increases. And I can only say that that's true for the half, uh, half right of this curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So x has to be more than one. That, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you check the mark scheme for that? Yeah, it is. It is. Okay, that's great then. Yep. You make it equal to zero. Get the one. And there. So I hope you guys understood what you meant here. Um, if we have a minimum point already, we know. And we know that it's a minimum point because we put it in the second derivative then minimum points typically look like this and this side is increasing this side is decreasing so we know that greater than one is the increasing side or you could yeah that's a good way to do it nice okay i'm not sure how the march team actually wanted us to do because they don't all mention it, yeah just a one mark. derivative at all it was kind yeah. of funny or wait, I think what they did was they just looked at the equation itself. Mm -hmm. 
or I don't know. It's kind of weird, but I think this was like one of the easiest way to do this question. It was a hard yeah. question though for what mark? It is. <laughs> My brain was thinking like, what if I make the second derivative less than uh, zero or something? <laughs> I don't think so. That would. Wait, that, wait, wait, wait. Is because if the second derivative is more than one, it's increasing. No, that that's not how it works. No, no, no. No, never mind. No, it's just like if it is more than zero, right? Then it's gonna uh, be minimum point. Minimum point. Yeah, it is. Right. That's why. So just yeah, that's the, that's the probably the most efficient way to do it. Just find the find what type of point it is and which side is what. Okay. Um, let's look at this diagram. Curve with da 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 da. A lot of these questions are paired with integration questions. So in the next video, you'll be seeing a lot of the same questions with integration parts on them. But for now, just here, let's let's go. Um, da 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 da. It wants us to find the x-coordinate of a, and a is the point where it crosses the y-axis. This is a really simple question. All it wants to do is y is zero. Y is zero here. So make y equal to zero. Nine x to half minus four x da, 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 da. you can get rid of the nine because it's multiplying i would just move the four x to the other side four x is equal to x minus half and multiply both sides by half of x i mean not half of x x to the power half that will give me 4x. Wait a second. Yes, it's we're good. Okay, 4x 3 by 2 plus 1, 2 by 2, 4 by 2, 4x squared equals 1. x squared equals 1 by 4. Hence, x is equal to square root 1 by 4. It says plus minus, but since I know it's on the positive side of the x-axis, I'm just going to put wait, wait, x I is equal to made a mistake. half. When you flipped the 4x to the power of negative 3 upon 2, uh, you changed oh, the... the negative 3. Oh, oh, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was thinking about changing the... 4's <laughs> sign and it changed the, the power sign. sign. Yeah. Four, you also <laughs> yeah, yeah. changed... <laughs> right, so pay attention, guys. You can't just change the sign because it's one to positive negative. Okay, so it I was... Mean, these kind of mistakes do happen. It does. Minus one. So what this means, instead of x squared, is 4 over x is equal to 1. So x is actually equal to 4. Okay, so this is 4. Let's check that. Yes, indeed, it is equal to four. They stated four only, so like I guess. Yeah, yeah, you can't say minus four or other sorts of numbers. Okay, next question. You can do this one, Guillaume. It's the same idea. Sure. Similar, a different so idea, says, but same question. Yeah. It just says that find the equation of the tangent to the curve at a. Quite easy, actually. We already know uh, what the x value of a is. It's 4, right? And uh, what we need to do is that we need to find the gradient, first of all, if we're trying to find the equation of the tangent. So we differentiate the equa curve equation. So dy upon dx would be equal to uh, negative 9 upon 2x to the power negative 3 upon 2. Yeah. Um, minus 36. Wait, no, let me just do this. Actually, let's just simplify a bit. So it's going to be 9 times 4 times negative 3 upon 2. 9 times 4 times negative 3 upon 2, which is equal to negative 54. 54? No, wait, no, no, wait. It should, yeah, plus. 54, yeah. Yeah. X to the power negative 5 upon 2. So we just opened the 9, by the way, guys. We multiply the 9 out. 
that's what you did yeah and now what we do is just um, make it e- wait and what we do now is just put in the value of four inside of this to find the gradient at that point and so when we uh, insert x equals to four we're gonna get mm-hmm. I'll try this nine upon two cool. negative nine upon 16 plus negative nine upon 16 plus four to the power negative five one two times 54 27 upon 16. So, so nice the final one. answer that we get is going to be uh, 9 upon 8 as the gradient. Yes. This is not the final answer, actually, sorry. This is just the gradient of the equation. And now what we're going to do is um, we're going to write it in the form of y equals to 9 upon 8x plus c. Yes. And then now we just need to find the value of c. We could just use point number A, uh, point A as the, as uh, one of the points, and mm-hmm. so at point four, uh, when x equals four, y equals to zero. So here's just going to be nine upon two. Plus c. Oh yeah, that's a good way to do it. So c uh, is then, just yeah, c is just going to be negative nine upon two. So final and, answer is yeah. And then we could just write it y equals to 9 upon 8, x minus 9 upon 2. Yeah, that's our equation of the tangent at point A. And they've, same thing, different form, or equivalent, as you can see here. Right? One point for differentiating, one point for plugging in value, one point for the line. Awesome. And believe it or not, this question has another part. Find the x-coordinate of the max point on this curve. Max point, right. So we already have dy dx. So I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to use it from the previous question. 9 over 2. x minus 3 square plus 54 x bar. 5 by 2, and this equals 0 because it's a stationary point. Remember, the gradient equals 0. Uh, it's going to be somewhere here. I can eyeball it. Somewhere around here, it gets flat, and then it starts going down again. You, I hope you guys can see it. I can't draw a straight line there. Um, since this side is 0, I can multiply by whatever I like. Uh, what I want to do first is I want to get rid of these weird x powers. So I'm going to I'm going to multiply by hmm, what looks right here. I'm just going to multiply by half first cuz eh. minus 9 by 2 3 um this is so silly. minus 1 plus 54 x da, 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 minus 2. And I don't like how these no, powers are negative, so I'm just going to multiply by x squared. That'll get rid of them. Oh, This will get to minus 9 by 2x, and this will just give me 54. So this equals 0. So minus 9 by 2x is equal to minus 54. Uh, x equals to minus 54 over 9 times 2. That's a 9, by the way, not a 2. That should give us a nice number. Oh, by 9, by the way. Remember your signs. 4 times 2, 9. So x is 12. But it says, yeah, just the x coordinate. So our answer is just x is 12. If it said coordinate, we'd have to find the y, but they don't bother. Right, so here it is. Make it equal 0, x is 12. The way did they did it is they factored, sort of, sort, if you can call it factored, they factored out 9 to the x minus 5, and they just made this part equal to 0. That's what they did. Anyway, you can solve equal to 0, whatever strikes your fancy.
Oh, this question. I like this screen. Do you want to do this one, Vyom? Actually, if you want to try it, you can. Yeah. Or okay, okay. I can try it. Whatever you want. I'll do this one. You, you can do the next one. Hmm. So this question is pretty rare. You don't see many like these. But when they do, they catch people off guard. It was on my summer exam. I could do it because I'd done this question before. But some of my classmates were like, what was that? There was an angle going on in the differentiation. Uh, so don't worry. It's not that bad. They want us to, to find the angle between these two curves tangents at point B. Same acute angle. Da, 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 da. Scales on the axes are the same. Oh, yeah, I think is... this question used vectors, right? Did it? Or maybe? Vectors? Is you you, question... is just rise over run. Once you get there, it's oh, yeah, it's I like might know what this is. I like might know what one. this is. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's exciting question. Okay, they want you to find the angle. How do you do this? It looks really intimidating with the five marks, but worry not. Okay, first thing you want to do is you want to find this gradient. Second thing you want to do is find this gradient. So let's do the first one first. Um, let y is equal 1x squared minus x plus 1. Then dy dx will equal to 2, eh, not 2, just x, because it half minus 1. And now they've, look at that. They've given us the point for b. They're so nice. OK. Um, if b is. If x is x is four, then dy by dx is equal to four minus one three. And our next one for this line, just gonna change color here so that it's clearer. For this line, um, dy by dx is x to the power of four minus x minus half power because multiplied by half and the constant term disappears right and b is four so at x is four then this will equal one by two half right is that right four to the power. yeah that's correct yeah that's correct okay so now we have two gradients and a lot of people will get stuck here. But the I, the trick is you want to find the angle between these two lines of gradient, this and this. So our let's I try to draw it sorted to scale. Here's our gradient one half, and here's our gradient three. I want to find the angle alpha. How to do? First of all. Hmm. Three. This is one half. I guess it would be better to draw a baseline. Yeah. Yeah. No, like a complete baseline. Like, or maybe oh, you, you mean show like... these as two different lines, maybe? These ones? To show their angle. Like the gradient with three and one and a half. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, like, like that. Yeah. Essentially. Okay, nice. Okay, so what you're going to do is what I would do in this situation, because I forgot how I did last time, uh, is like this. I'd find this angle here. And then I'd find this angle here. I'll change color. That would help. Okay, you might see where I'm going with this. I'll find this angle here. I'll call it theta. I'll find this angle here. I'll call it beta. And then I'll subtract the two. And how will I find these angles? Well, rise over <laughs> run, baby. Woohoo. <laughs> and we know that it's it tangent. Is. You know, like it just rise over run, that's the same as the tangent in triangle. Yeah, that's we know the Yeah, 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 yeah. Um this is a right angle triangle we've just drawn here. And this is uh I want to find this angle. Alternate over opposite. Toa. You guys know this. Um, so this 
rise is one, this run is two. So theta is tan inverse. Am I in radian mode? That's it. Degree mode. Okay, we're good. Tan inverse opposite one half. 26 degrees, right? It is one by two. Yes, good. So theta is 26.5. Seven degrees. I'll put for now, and now let's find beta. B, beta is going to be tan inverse. I'll show you the rise by run for this one. It's three up, one across. So three up by one across. This is a really mean question. Cambridge examiners, please don't do this too much but Cambridge students Wait, please way, be prepared for this uh, yeah. you just wrote a uh, two accidentally there where uh three oh, oh yeah <laughs> my, my bad 56.31 okay so now I know beta and I know theta which are stuff I just made up let's get to the real deal which is alpha is going to be beta minus theta which is 56.31 minus 26.57. By the way, you I think you forgot to change the 56.31 after you changed the 2 to the 1. Because for me, tan inverse 1... Oh, yeah, is it isn't. Wait. Oh, wait. Tan inverse 3 yeah, yeah. give you 71.57. See daisies. 71.56. Thanks for cross-checking. 71.56. You just wrote it at seven, I think. Because it's gonna be much more neater when we subtract these both. It's complete like it's the same and same decimals. Oh okay. I got like fifty six oh yeah. Five six five, so it rounds up to five six seven. Forty five? Wait, wait, what? I'm just saying that like uh the seventy one point five six, right? It rounds mm -hmm. up to seventy one point five seven. Oh yeah, whoops. Sorry. And now it like uh subtracts perfectly. Oh nice. So alpha is forty five degrees. Would you look at that? And if you check the mark scheme, indeed it is. Yippee. So differentiate both curves, find their gradients at that point. Use tan inverse to find those angles and subtract them to get alpha. Okay. I think this is our last question. Yeah. Yep. Would you do the honors? Sure. So um, a curve is such that dy upon dx is equal to 6 divided by 3x minus 2 cube. And a, this is this, lies on the curve. A point is moving along the curve at a. Uh, and at A, the y-coordinate of the point is increasing at 3 units per second. Note that down. So we're saying that dy upon dt is 3. We have gotten this one value. Find the rate of increase at A of the x-coordinate of the point. Uh, what we need to find is uh, dx upon dt. Right now. So I'm going to use my previous logic again, previous way of thinking. So I'm going to do dx upon dt is equal to dy upon dt times something, something. And that something, something should be dy, dx upon dy. And we have kind of already found in, found dy upon, dx, wait, dy upon dx. We just need to flip that now. And when we do that and multiply that by three, we get dx upon dt is equal to three times three x minus two cube. Yeah, uh, times three. Or you can just put it in the fraction, it's fine. Either way it works. But now you might see that it, oh wait, we've been literally given everything, even the x value of at a. Right, so what we do is that. Oh, that's, cra I, that's crazy. Yeah, I thought that we were gonna have to like find it, but never mind. It's just given, so we just put one inside of that. 
and yeah. uh, what we're gonna get is gonna be three minus two, that which is one. Yeah, uh, and then one upon two, essentially. Um. Yeah, one minus a uh, three minus two cube over two. One half. Yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be the rate half. of change of x with respect to time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And as you see, that is exactly what we have. At x Yay. is one, dy dx is oh they just they just substituted in x at dy dx, then flipped it later. Or you could flip it oh, okay. flip I the see. formula and put it in. But <laughs> sure, sure, Cambridge, okay, if you say so. Okay. This is actually kind of nice. interesting. That's an interesting way of actually doing it. I just realized. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is all for differentiation. This is a bit of a tough topic. So I do recommend you do a lot of practice. But that's all for today. Happy revision and good luck. Yeah, I just want to say thank you all for tuning in in this session. I hope that you had a great understanding of the topic. And you can get hold of the you know, uh, notes on their website. And it'll be in the description below. Our social media handles are, would, uh, are also in our description. And so feel free to connect with us and feel free to drop any of your questions. So yeah, see you later in the next upload. Bye-bye.